Welcome to another discussion of Annex Cloud Market Movers, where we bring in market experts and luminaries to help us through these times. Today, I have Charles Nichols. He's the GM of Upscale Commerce at SAP. Uh, welcome to the discussion, Charles. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, wonderful. Uh, Charles, uh, we've seen uh, some interesting times, uh, you know, so to speak, in 2020. Uh, in terms of kind of the, the economic climate as well as uh, COVID-19 and many other things that are happening. Uh, today, I wanted to kind of focus on the discussion as it pertains to digital transformation uh, and maybe more specifically digital commerce uh, and the impact of that. Now, you know, one on the on slightly silver lining on the, uh, on the challenges, digital commerce has exploded. Uh, we all know that it's sort of grown uh, astronomically over the last few months, uh, you know, some statistics show that at least in North America, it went from close to 6% to 14% in a decade, it went from 14 to 27% in less than three months. And so that's a decade worth of jump in, in, in less than uh, three months. Uh, so that's, that's huge. Um, you know, what's your take as it pertains to businesses and moving that transformation, you know, to online and in, in a fast way? Well, you say interesting times. I mean, of course, the uh, Chinese curse is may you live in interesting times. You know, uh, definitely, definitely some very uh, challenging times for some businesses. Um, in they've seen, a, you know, you see this polarization of either it's really up and it's moving really fast, or it's really down, and you know, one of one of these two. Depending upon where you are, really on the spectrum, um, you're, you know, some businesses have been very heavily impacted by supply chain disruption, uh, and therefore you know, the, the move is to try and go direct to consumer as fast as possible because traditional channels of supply don't exist in the same way as they, they did before. Um, and in the other cases, you then see businesses that are scaling and struggling to, to deal with demand. And, you know, we've had notices saying we're not taking any more orders on e-commerce sites, which I mean, I've never seen in you know, all of my history with e-commerce. It's, you know, very, very unusual times. Um, and really what it's doing is it's just, I think, accelerating trends that have been there for a while. Um, you see this actually broader than just e-commerce, but in digital transformation in general. For example, where I come from in the UK, um, a senior exec in the health service basically said in two weeks they did more digital transformation than they'd done in the previous 20 years, you know, which just reflects what they were doing, you know, which is everything suddenly has to go digital. We need to find different ways of doing things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think really this is an acceleration of things that have already been there, not rather than something new. Um, you talked about compressing, you know, amount of growth in e-commerce into a shorter space of time. Now, you know, there's an argument that, you know, buyer behavior will go back to where it was before, or maybe partially back. If we look at previous big disruptive events, um, you know, whether that's the uh, dot com boom or the credit crunch or these sorts of things these big disruptive events e-commerce tended to come out out of the other side of it you know with uh, as a you know with a, a growth spurt behind it you know with um as an accelerator really where it's part of the solution in the case of the credit crunch or in fact um uh, dot com dot com crash where you maybe have a big recession or something like that and customers can then become very price sensitive they want to shop around for a better deal in which case e-commerce then from a consumer's point of view you know is part of that solution as well wonderful and, and you know you bring a a different twist to it from an upscale perspective um you know i i think that may be more adapted to the times now uh, you know sap as a company has had a commerce solution for a very long time uh, but uh, there was a need, it seems like, to, to bring in a alternative uh, to the market. Could you talk a little bit about what the differentiation is and how you're positioning it? Yeah, I mean, Upscale is a, a brand new uh, B2C e-commerce platform. Um, it, it's kind of designed specifically to kind of revolutionize commerce. That's kind of how we set out to do it. Um, really because we felt that uh, B2C was showing um, showing some signs of needing something fresh and in particular there were a, a series of things you know looking for a, a lower uh, total cost of ownership a faster time to value if you go talk to you know Gartner or Forrester they'll say those two things are the biggest issues in, in e-commerce which is you know how do I how do I get it live faster uh, it's uh, more agility if you like and how do I do it at a cheaper cost so um, a lot of what Upscale has been focused on is really how can we do that so that we can open up the market 
quite significantly. We're, we're not aiming at necessarily the same market. We're aiming, aiming really to expand the market quite significantly. When you do that with new technology, you know, with a totally lower cost of ownership, um, then you can very often find that all of a sudden people can do e-commerce where they couldn't before. We see that, for example, in smaller markets or um, or in or where in particular in digital transformation where people want to try something out or do something new or something fresh or they want to experiment all those sorts of things and that really requires a different kind of approach which um, may mean much more sort of no code or low code um, you know it's more out of the box or something like that um, but there's also through to commercial models you know which are sort of you know, more pay as you go rather than a big upfront commitment where you're changing the balance of kind of, you know, what a traditional commerce project has looked like. You know, th these have often looked like a, a big waterfall project where there's a big commitment and, you know, you know, it's going to be six months to a year. And there are always some horrendous stories of, you know, people who've taken, you know, more than a year or whatever, you know, had really painful experiences. So, so the time to value has got to, got to get compressed really to open up these, uh, open up these new use cases and again that whole theme has been totally accelerated by by covid because um you know there's now a crying urgency right you either you know if you've never been uh direct to consumer before you've only been b2b for example which is a very common conversation i have daily with customers then uh this is now um a screamingly urgent priority right and therefore i cannot be planning on a 12 month implementation cycle, I need to be able to do something much, much faster. Absolutely. And, and you know, that, that speed to market extremely, as you said, is, is very important based on what's going on today. You know, uh, specifically related to commerce and, and specifically related to sort of that uh, change in the times. One of the things that a topic that's near and dear to our heart, and, and we've seen this over and over back in 2008 or 2001, the other crises uh, that happened was this move towards keeping your customers happy. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a saying that during kind of uh, boom times, you focus very much on the top of the funnel. During uh, challenging times, you keep, want to keep your customers close to your heart and keep them extremely excited and retain them. And so retention and loyalty is, is extremely important. Now, where, where you come from, from a upscale perspective or from a digital commerce perspective, you know, what is your take on retention and loyalty as it pertains to commerce? Well, I think the, I mean, if you start with consumers and how consumers have gone through this experience, I've sort of studied uh, consumer online buyer behavior for a long time. And, uh, and, and it's fascinating, of course, <clears throat> um, maybe for the first time in, I don't know, a generation or maybe multi-generation, consumers have experienced scarcity for the first time, they've seen empty shelves, you, you know, uh, queuing outside stores. I mean, stores rationing at some points. I mean, these things have long and lasting effects, right? Um, you know, I remember my, um, my grandmother was an eye surgeon in World War II. And uh, I can remember, you know, when I was a kid, I go in and see her from the outside or whatever. The first thing she made me do was wash my hands. She was focused on hygiene, right? Of course, we do that all the time now. Um, and then years later, when I cleared out her flat, I found that um, the, uh, she was hoarding boxes and boxes and boxes of soap, right? You know, in a, like two years worth of supply of soap, more than she could ever use. And the, the, the reality is, is some of these effects can be quite long lasting. And um, one of the things that we have built into, uh, into Upscale is this whole concept of continuity commerce. And continuity is a very much an idea of, to, of today and very relevant today in that it, it's focused more on those auto ship kind of a subscription where instead of buying a one off product, maybe I can I can buy a subscription to this. Um, and this is this is pretty important because in an era where the customer can't then get the product, certain product categories are super sensitive. Anything that touches the skin, you know, deodorant or toothpaste or makeup remover or any of these things or shampoo these things consumers are very very reluctant to switch brand right they, you know they're very sensitive about that all the brand loyalty studies show um, that those things are, are critically important and and as a result if you now have a, a consumer where there's been a scarcity of some of those sorts of things then um, behavior will change and there's an opportunity maybe to turn products into subscriptions and when you do that if you do that well and a good order management system will do this for you 
Um, it should then reserve those out of stock. So you never go out of stock on your subscriptions because this is very high margin business, you know, which, which serves both the brand uh, and the consumer really well. The consumer gets reliability of supply, never runs out, um, you know, quality of supply as well. They know it's coming from the brand manufacturer, but, you know, there's no sort of authenticity issues or any of those sorts of things. And at the same time that the brand gets the sort of a higher margin kind of a picture. And in all of that, a lot of this is really around, you know, wallet share, which is how do we maximize wallet share for our consumers? And to make those programs work really well, you need loyalty elements in there. Uh, you need surprise and delight at the right time and all these sorts of things to sort of prevent churn and make sure that you keep those customers happy over a long period of time. Um, up, uh, SAP also acquired Qualtrics um, last year. Um, and we also see Qualtrics as playing a very important role in this as well, which is taking the temperature of, of customers on a regular basis to make sure that we understand exactly where they are uh, from a sentiment point of view. And, you know, that whole delivery, quality of experience, did the product actually do what it's supposed to do? Did it arrive on time? Was the packaging good? You know, could I use it? Was it damaged? Did I have to return it? All of that stuff is incredibly important to loyalty. It tends to get forgotten when we talk about commerce. We think commerce is all about, you know, personalization and the website making it look pretty. But the reality is it's that end-to-end -end journey, those things that really make the difference, um, you know, as to whether you end up with a customer for life or, or ultimately whether, you know, somebody gets deeply frustrated. Absolutely. And I think though, those two things that you mentioned specifically around sort of understanding and get, garnering customer feedback and then applying it to continuity commerce to kind of manage churn along the way, because keeping it longer is really the, the play there is extremely important. A couple of things I would add, you know, in this sort of uh, element is, you know, in this case where the time to market is, is important and people are getting up to speed, this might be a digitally native brand or it might be a, a, a digitally native brand within a larger company that's being launched. It's important to kind of when they acquire these customers to, to keep them around, um, you know, especially some of these customers may have uh, connected to the brand digitally for the first time. So they might be experiencing the, the, the product through a third party, potentially, right? They might have bought it at a retail store, but this is the first time they're buying it online. And so the brand is now acquiring a customer, or at least acquiring a customer name that they, they had a customer, but didn't know who they, that was. And sort of keeping that customer and sort of happy in an ongoing perspective is, is important as well. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and for the first time, if they're brand going direct, taking responsibility for customer service, which they've not had to do before. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and how do you handle returns and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. And, you know, we have been conditioned to phenomenal service from uh, an Amazon or wherever where, you know, it's returned without a quibble and away you go. And, and therefore, you've got to get geared up ready for that as, as part of the story. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to go back to uh, some of the principles you were talking about, you know, time to market, you know, speed versus customization, you know, that's sort of the, the piece of the, the founding principles for upscale you were talking about and very, very adapt for the current times. But what are other things that are important um, from a commerce perspective that you are focusing on that create a differentiator in the marketplace? I mean, commerce has been around for a very long time. Um, and so a lot of people have, have innovated in it for the last 20 years and we've learned from the things that have worked and then sort of the speed part is important, but are there other things that you're focusing on in the near future that will make it differentiated within this, uh, the space? Yeah, I mean, we're very, very fortunate with Upscale in that there's a, there's a, there's a huge amount of innovation in here. And it, when we said we set out really to try and reinvent commerce, we have, we've done that at many levels, um, you know, from the fact that AI is built in from day one. You know, it's not kind of bolted on as an after effect. It basically, basically fundamentally changes what, uh, you know, what you can do. The fact that the store self optimizes, um, you know, personalizes automatically at the individual level, make sure that you're balancing your inventory and exposure or I mean, many, many of these things. But, but the reinvention you perhaps see um, probably starting with mobile and mobile is very important. I mean, We've seen over the last few years, this gradual shift to mobile now, there's about 70%, depending upon your brand stats, of traffic um, on mobile devices, and yet only about 30% of conversion. So there's this, this gap between people buying on the device and, and, and people actually being on the device in the first place. One of the, one of the golden lessons, of course, for any marketer or merchandiser is we have to be where our customers want to be. If they want to be on mobile, they don't want to ship, they don't want to um, stop shopping on mobile, and then go onto a desktop 
uh, in order to then complete the transaction. And you know, we call that reshopping. It happens very commonly when you cross channels, whether you go from mobile into store or mobile to desktop or whatever. You know, reshopping is very destructive because um, it's a bad experience for the customer and the customer loses momentum and perhaps doesn't then complete the transaction and all these sorts of things happen. You can't track the customer typically as they move across those channels, so it becomes very hard, right? So, so, so one of the things that we did is we really thought about this and said, okay, well, well, let's build the next generation of commerce mobile first, right? So um, many of the concepts in commerce were designed for, uh, you know, a screen this shape, not this shape, and a big screen like this with a, with a keyboard and a mouse. And of course, when you take that and you then squeeze it down into this little form factor, it's very difficult, right? And, and you know, we have this thing called responsive design where we, we take and we squeeze and we try and reshape it. And the reality, of course, is that uh, it doesn't work very well. And there are many, many, many examples of that. And that's why you have this gap between conversions on mobile devices and conversions on desktop. So one of the things that we've done is we've fundamentally changed that so that the experience is very visual. We think about which content gets displayed. You've got very little real estate. You haven't got the same real estate that you have on, uh, you know, on your desktop device. You can't just take all your categories, for example. Your category tree could be long, you know, with maybe sort of 30 or 40 or 50 categories. You squeeze those all onto a small phone. Hmm, that doesn't work so well, right? You know, so, um, so we've tried to make it a very sort of a, a visual swipe, tap, pinch, we call that a tap, tap, buy kind of experience, where it's as easy as just finding things and navigating through. And we use a lot of AI to figure out what to show, given the limited real estate, those sorts of things. And then link that in with uh, progressive web app technology or native apps, which you can deploy to very easily. Um, and uh, and mobile wallet payments, you know, where, where it's using an Apple Pay or, or Google Pay or something like that, where in, in fact, the checkout experience is now significantly faster than on desktop on mobile. So as a result of that, you see the combination of this much more native, visual, engaging experience coupled with very easy payment on the device because all the, you know, the payment card and information, and your shipping and billing details or an email address, they're already in there, right? It's literally, oh yeah, I'll have one of those, bang, you know, and you can see up to three or even 400% increases in page revenue by putting you know, a, a, a one tap buy capability in the right place for the right product. So um, this is really truly a revolution that is happening. Uh, and I think it just reflects the fact that people have shifted to, shifted to mobile. So there's two dimensions for you. Um, there are many more. No, absolutely. No, thank you for sharing that. And I've, you know, I've personally been in the commerce space a very long time and, you know, building sort of commerce from nine, you know, 99 onwards or 2001 onwards. Um, and, and, you know, we, we used to reimagine, right? The word responsive been around for a while, but you know, went from desktop to make it mobile friendly to be, you know, mobile adaptive to mobile responsive to mobile apps to, you know, now most recently PWA and everything else. And so what you're saying is essentially starting natively from mobile ground up makes a big difference, right? And that's sort of how it's natively imagined and then adapting and using AI to present the right things at the right time because you can't present everything right away and it's not the right, you know, user experience is extremely important. So I think those are some great uh, differentiators. Uh, lastly, you know, if uh, is, is kind of going away from technology, if you were uh, speaking to me and I was the exec at, at one of the, the, the large brands that were, that were not direct to commerce, um, you know, but they were kind of selling through other, you know, channels or whatever else, but now with COVID, now we're really strongly considering this. But at the same time, I have certain other disruptions happening in the, in the marketplace. My retailers aren't selling because they're closed or, or I have distribution challenges or manufacturing challenges. So I have a lot to deal with while still considering the future of being able to kind of build and, and, and grow into a direct to commerce space. What kind of advice are you giving executives at this point in time and how to consider operational challenges versus future growth and thought process around that? Yeah, I mean, in, in many respects, many of the executives I talk to now are, are to some extent in a relatively tactical mode. You know, the really bigger, big strategic projects have perhaps been kind of put on hold while we're trying to figure out what happens. Is there a second wave and all this sort of other stuff? And, you know, you know we hope there isn't and everyone stays safe and all that stuff, right. But, but the reality is, is we have to plan for a more uncertain future um, with supply disruption. And whilst the traditional caution really around going direct to consumer is I'm gonna upset my channel, 
I mean, that's just kind of gone now. People just don't see that anymore because the, if the channel cannot deliver product or, you know, get, get product in the hands of customer, then, you know, you've got this massive disruption, then you have to do something else. And therefore that's another way that it's kind of accelerating a trend that kind of was, was already there. Um, the, so the advice I would give really, um, I mean, is obviously, you know, you, a, a direct channel gives you an end relationship with consumer. Um, that's important for a combination of reasons, right? It's not just the security of supply and the, uh, the fact that you can, you know, as as channels shift or as disruptions come in or black swan events happen, um, that you know you can that you can still continue to sell, but also you get a feedback channel, you have feedback coming back direct from consumers about do they like the product or not. This takes you into the realm of even you know post COVID or pre COVID into the realm of uh, a digital first product launch, where actually you launch a product digital first, effectively into a test market of your best consumers that buy from you online. And, uh, and then you can get the sales data from that and figure out, do we need to change the formulation? Do we need to change the packaging? Do we need to change the pricing? Have we got it right? We'll take that sales data directly into your uh, retail stores and your traditional distribution and use that data to then negotiate you know, your shelf space and everything else that you would do. Normally, you're putting a lot of money in that to try and get the new product, the right shelf space and get the attention and put it on an end cap and all this other stuff. There's lots of sort of trade promotion money going into launching the product. But if you already have the sales data coming from a different channel, then you have the option to, opportunity to do that. So, so that's one example of why, uh, why it's, it's kind of important. The other one really is, is around that brand loyalty, is the ability to serve on a consistent basis and maybe even own the shelf you know it could be the bathroom shelf at home or it could be the snack cupboard or or you know snacking is, is one of those trends which is very important right in in uh, in lockdown terms um so do you, you know can you own the snack shelf can you deliver a regular supply a regular box and all those sorts of things on, on continuity we talked about earlier on um you know they're very important in terms of wallet share and and helping build that build that ongoing relationship there are also two other opportunities I'll call out as well. Uh, one would be um, minority brands. So these could be what you might think of as long tail items where uh, it's an older brand and it's got a specialist following. It's not distributed by, in as many places as you would normally have, those sorts of things. This is perfect for direct to consumer because you've got you know, brand fans who can't easily access the product. Right, and it's a smaller brand that your distribution channel maybe don't care about so, so much. So this is a great place to start, right? You're not going to upset any channel partners. You've got already some loyal fans, and you know, and and, and therefore a great opportunity. Another one to think about, think about the operational challenges is maybe um, thinking about uh, mom and pop stores. So mom and pop stores are interesting because. Um, you know, they uh, have had disrupted supply. They may not be able to get your product from the distribution when they go to Costco or wherever else it is, uh, whichever other uh, distributor they're going to, um, you know, because they have disrupted supply and therefore they'll sell whatever, you know, happens to be in stock. So, you know, to manage that and get the loyalty of that small retailer local is kind of important, particularly important at the moment because consumers in lockdown are shopping more local and they're shopping closer to home and all those sorts of things. They don't want to go into the the big queue up and mask up shopping experience in the supermarket, then maybe, you know, the shop local thing actually works really quite well. The other, the other nice twist about shop local from a brand point of view is you may well be able to sell by the pallet, right? Sorry, rather, not by the pallet, by the case. You may be able to sell by the case. If you're used to shipping a pallet, going to a case is much more manageable and to a, to a sort of a small trade than it is to go down to individual items for individual uh, individual shipment to consumers. So it's, if you like a baby step on that route. And again, loyalty then is going to be critically important. Those typically cash sales and therefore you're going to have some kind of a loyalty scheme uh, to hook in those retailers to keep them coming back and, uh, and reward them for, uh, you know, for that ongoing uh, um, loyalty they give to you. Yeah, and I, I really like the last one because I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you're focused on B2C, but this is more B2Small B, but it sort of behaves like B2C in a way, right? In, in, in some yeah. Part. Yeah. And so the concepts are similar, but at the same time, that continuity piece really applies because these smaller retailers probably want to buy on a continual basis on an ongoing basis. I also really like the first point you mentioned about kind of that feedback loop. Uh, that's extremely important for the brand because a lot of brands are investing tons of amount of money. And one of the things, the reason I really like that twist is 
and, and or my thought on, on that twist is, you know, in the upcoming years, a lot of brands will start figuring out how they can save costs and save costs will become by default a, 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 a mantra that they have to just inherently do as part of business. And part of saving costs is not investing too much in that whole supply chain experience, building the product and, and getting feedback before you know it's going to be successful, where they can actually in here, direct to commerce, really test this out, get feedback in a very, very quick experience perspective before investing significantly in marketing or growing other channels beyond it. And so, you know, sort of plays to that, that cutting, co you know, the cost uh, sensitivity that might play in the near future as well. Uh, Charles, lots of amazing, great ideas. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and wish you much success with, with Upscale. Um, and uh, for everyone else, if uh, you want to see more interviews uh, like we had with uh, Charles, uh, please go to annexcloud.com slash marketmovers. Uh, thank you very much again. Bye for now. Thanks.